<laughs> Give us a thumbs up, Mark, when you're good. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, here we go, party people. We're, we're kicking off. Okay. Delay by two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So um, we have a technical issue. Uh, filmmaking. Classic filmmaking. Um, apparently, there's an issue with the lens, um, which is, um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it can't focus. Well, it's a good thing. It can't focus on me, but unfortunately, it's not focusing on Ken. Um, so we will, um, we're going to wait. So if anybody knows any songs. Uh, any questions in advance of starting? Can you, can you hear me? Is this better? Yeah. Yep. Brilliant. Anybody got any questions now before we start? Believe me, guys, <laughs> I shall be here to ask you guys lots of questions. So I expect everybody to be focused in and giving back because it's all about collaboration all the time. When you're shooting stuff, you're making, when you're writing, getting ideas. Um, actually, I'll probably mention this later on, but I'm here in one way. Um, are we good? Fantastic. How's it focused? I'm stealing from you guys because for me, one of the most powerful things in the world is to be inspired. And hopefully after today's session, someone's going to say something or I'll make a connection where I get a bounce back and I'll be inspired myself because all of my ideas come from moments of inspiration so hopefully you guys will get something good from it so no pressure there yeah okay <laughs> i'm gonna go around we know your names we know your student numbers so we'll, we'll put them in i'll do a rolodex and the okay so as soon as we can get a thumbs up got two thumbs up hello everyone thank you for being here um and welcome and we ha are lucky enough to have kenneth d barker um, who's... Now, I I gotta say that is a warm welcome. So like you can you can you can, you can rest easy. Yeah. Now um, I just want to make it very clear. Kenneth is not a relation. Okay. We we do share the same son. I think we are somehow related but kenneth is of the mind that we definitely aren't so i just have to kind of just putting that out there but anyway kenneth is a writer producer director who attended northern school of film and television to train as a producer He has written produced and directed five micro budget feature films for home entertainment and he's consulted on a multitude of other film projects two of his films kingdom and catalina a new kind of superhero um, have both achieved uh, the British Board of Film Classification Ratings, which we'll hopefully talk about in a bit. He has also worked as an editor, a supervising editor, visual effects supervisor, and a visual effects artist. He is currently working as a producer for a Leeds-based production company that specializes in high-end brand videos and visual engineering. So, Ken, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricky. And yeah, it's, the floor's yours. You, I know you've got a presentation, so take it as you want. Brilliant. Good afternoon, everyone, first of all. Um, bear with me a second, so I'm not used to using one of these clipping devices. So can I stand up, actually? Right, first of all, can I just get a quick temperature check of who's in the room? Because obviously you know a bit about me. Do we have anybody here who wants to be a producer down the line? film producer or TV producer. Feel free to stick your hands up, thank you. Do we have any directors? Yeah, what about editors? Yeah, screenwriters? Journalists as well, journalism students? Yep, you're all on journalism course, okay, that's cool. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Is there any category I've missed out anyone else? Are you guys getting any chances for live experience of actually working on jobs and bits and pieces yet so far? Yeah? But are you getting placements out in the industry? Yeah? 
Brilliant. Good on you. Um, just give me a second here. Just down over here. Ooh. Don't worry, it's one of the worst things in the world for, for someone in my position to stand here just reading off a piece of paper. So I'll try and keep my heads up and go forward that way. Um, but here is me. If I... There we go. Did it? Hang on, I've just jumped to screen. It's quite sensitive. Did it? That's a publicity shop for the company I'm actually working for, who specialise in um, visual engineering and. I'm on Twitter as well. Yep, I'm holding a Canon camera lens. It was great fun doing this. The guys I work for are mega talented, very talented people. So that's me. I started off trillions of years ago, back in 1997. This is my company. Da -da. W O T R. Has anybody heard that expression before? Water on the rock. What does that mean to anyone? Yeah, there's two things behind this. There's a guy called Desmond Tutu. Anybody heard of Desmond Tutu? Yeah. He was talking about um, the political system in South Africa. And I want to avoid getting into politics. But he said, if you put enough water, sorry, the people push against the system of apartheid for long enough, they'll crack it open and break it apart. And the same thing also applies in engineering. If you put enough water on anything, you will degrade it. You'll eventually break it open. I was walking down Chapel Town Road many years ago thinking, how the hell do you get into the film industry? It's like water on the rock. Ding! To me, that says you have to be persistent. So if you're in this room and you're a creative, you're a writer, producer, journalist, you have to stick to it. I believe in just sticking to it. It doesn't mean flogging a dead horse and, you know, running out of ideas. Sometimes it takes a long-range vision to stick to and get through in the end. Yeah, and a lots of opportunity will come along the way. So that's my company. On there, you'll find all my work from years back up to my modern stuff. It's streaming. We'll come on to streaming a bit more later on. My bias, as you can possibly appreciate, is as a filmmaker, as a producer. You know, I, I call myself a creative producer because I write, produce, and direct, edit. If you put a broom at my bum, I'll probably sweep the floor as well. So that is me, essentially, in a nutshell, my company. Oh, here we go then. Anybody recognize one of these? The two pieces of machinery. Care to shout out what you might think they are? Um, camera, camera. Oh. <laughs> is he right? Yeah. Yeah, essentially correct. This is the company I work for. Uh, I don't know if this has got a pointer on. Has it got a pointer on this? No, that's fine. No worries. Uh, this part, this is a Cinebot. The company I work for is called Tungsten Media. And this is a Cinebot. It's a standard modified industrial robot. It's got a great big juicy red camera mounted on the end on a prime lens. And the whole point of having a Cinebot is for the type of work we now do, it allows us to do can repeat movements over a particular product. And the company I'm working for specialize in all kinds of different areas. Um, we've just done a big campaign for Kerrygold, the butter brand. Anybody use Kerrygold? I have a head, a couple of people nodding. It's very interesting because their presence in the UK is actually very limited. Globally, they are a very big brand. So this is why they're relaunching and we've landed the job for their social media. So their ads are starting to appear on uh, Facebook and other social media. Uh, they also, we also do many other types of video. There's a company called Portland Restaurants who make very good quality uh, pre-made Persian food. Uh, we've just shot a brand video for those guys. Do we have any gardeners here? Anybody interested in gardening? <laughs> Same as me. Got a guy doing this. You can come and do my place. We've just done a big job for a company called Even Greener who make uh, composters, rain savers, all the stuff you put in your garden. They've just had us commissioned to shoot this wonderful woman at long brand video. In fact, the guy who directed it, he's made it look like a mini movie. We shot on an Ari Alexa, so a really good quality camera. And to watch it, it makes you think, wow, are you actually selling a product or a lifestyle? It's a perfect blend of their product and it's a synergy. Yeah, so that's the kind of thing we do, the red camera. We also use a thing called a Phantom, which is designed to shoot at very high speed, so it slows things down. Yeah, brilliant. 
So that's those two things here. So I started off back in um, quite some time ago, so I don't want to actually reveal my age. You can perhaps, you know, mention, speaking to Mark, actually, everyone's reminded me of a certain few things, and Ricky, of course. Uh, my very first project came from, anybody heard of Robocop? Yeah. Robocop. The first film blew my mind away because I found it incredibly, a good piece of storytelling, but incredibly violent and everything else. And of course, when the sequel came out in 1991, I think, or 1990, I went to see it at a special midnight screening in my hometown at Ipswich. And um, I, came out, I came out of the cinema. I was completely, ugh. But I did think um, I could do better. I have this foolish, you know, young person notion of I could possibly do better. And by chance, I came across this book. Anybody heard of Beowulf? Yeah. yeah, it's an absolute classic book. It really, really blew my mind away, it inspired me. I had a quite an old English text version of it. But it gave me this crazy idea to have a go at making my own film. Have you guys actually gone out and just written your own articles, made your own stuff yet, anybody? Yeah? It's um, difficult, isn't it? It's interesting. Yeah. It's it took a lot of time to get this running together. Um, and back then, I had a Hi8 camera. Anybody come across Hi8 as a film format? format? Oh, brilliant. I have one hand showing up. It is some people, your film purists, will say, oh, shoot on Hi8 because it's got a great aesthetic. If you ever come across one of these people, take it on my authority get some matches and set fire to their trousers. Because you guys are living right now, you're in a time, you're in a place with the technology here, it's stuff I couldn't even dream about five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, but I, back in the day, had to shoot on um, high eight, and then we had to point the projector, high eight is a very small film format, had to point the projector at a screen like this, and then set up a, a video camera to actually record off the screen to do the editing from. So really back in the dark ages. But when that film was completed, it allowed me to go where, do you think? Any guesses? Where did my first film allow me to get into? Shout. I'll let you know. I was, well, my ex-girlfriend at the time said, Ken, you've made your film, uh, so you can shut up talking about it. <laughs> But have you considered going to film school? And it was like, bing, light number one went on. You need to be around people who've got the same mindset as you who want to create and do things, yeah? Uh, and then, so I went to my local careers place. They didn't actually laugh me out. They got this big journal of different film schools out. And the first one I came to was Leeds. It's not corny. I had this wonderful, warm feeling come over me. So I rang up the guy who was the head of the course, a guy called Barry Callahan back in the day. And he said, once I told him that I produced this film, I wanted to be a producer, yada, yada, yada. He said, come for an interview. I've never looked back, basically. And at film school, can I press that a bit harder? There we go. We had stuff like this. This picture would be circa 1995, I think. Anybody recognize the piece of machinery there? You're warm, you're warm, Mark. Yeah, warm, warm. It's an instrument of torture <laughs> called a steam beck. It's a flat plate, plate steam beck. This is a six reel steam beck. You see that blue stuff around here? That is your footage and it's also where your sound goes. So it's played through the part in the middle where my friend Marina has a hand and the black screen there projects where your film is. So you literally, you'd go off with your camera, shoot your film, send the film to the laboratory, they would make a rush print or a copy, you stick it in your Steam Deck and it'd edit the film away. So we were doing short films on this and all day long you would hear this very noisy machine playing back, shuttling back and forward. It was a very laborious process. I think with today's technology, of course it's all digital, digital non-linear, you can work probably 20 times faster, but you still have to know how and when to edit. So your skill set still needs to be there. You were hampered back in the day here. 
I'm working with Marina, who didn't actually go to film school. She kind of became a, a massive, mega, super talented hanger on her. Um, a, a real great groupie, because back in the day there, the film school was twinned with the film school in Poland, Łódź. And a lot of guys came over to direct and produce, but the guy who directed my film, well, put it this way, Anybody know Tesco Superstore on Round Hay Road in Leeds? Yes. Yep. Uh, back in the day, that wasn't a 24-hour store. And we had a scene to shoot in the film. And I managed to get permission to go in mega early with the full film crew and a couple of actors to shoot the film in there before the store opened up. And one thing I've really learned as a producer, the buck stops with you, or me in my case, yeah? I had my director there and the screenwriter and guess what? Those two didn't get on because the director was starting to, shall we say, politely extract the urine by changing the script. And it would have been my job to be the blocker between the two and also have a lot more creative input, but I was still very incredibly green, yeah? So we got to a point on this film, which is being edited here in Tesco, it's about, I don't know, six, quarter past six in the morning, and the screenwriter, this is a whole other thing. Should the screenwriter have been on set that day? I thought it was a courtesy to invite the screenwriter because the director said prerogative to artistically change the screenplay. But got to the point, though, where the actual screenwriter punched the director in front of two principal actors and about 20 film crew and various other people working in the store. So... Um, I was put in a rather awkward position of making sure we wrapped that day and then going to the screenwriter and say, sorry, mate, but you can no longer come to the set. And he called me a name, which I can't say because we are in wonderful polite company, but it was certainly, it would make the rest of my hair drop out. Mm -hmm. So um, just be wary if you do produce in the future, or if you're a director, you have to collaborate and work together. Don't become this loose cannon because that is, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. The thing is, one of the key things I learned from film school, I finished my film. I know so many people who are still today making films, people putting a lot of time in and giving effort, but they don't finish the bloody work. So if I catch anybody in this room, I know where you live, I can find out, I'll break GDPR, I'll come and find you and I'll smack your bottom. Finish your work. Because it's got no value unless people can see the completed work, yeah? So that is a, a real good lesson for me. I, it was a, anybody had a love-hate relationship before? A love-hate relationship. My year at film school was love-hate. I hated big chunks of it, um, but I also loved it because I learned my trade. I had to go through some real, you know, combative times, but I learned how to complete a film and shoot it and produce it on film and all the administration stuff around it. Ah! Anybody ever had a rejection letter before? Yep. Brilliant. I, I had so many letters. I have. And it's only recently I've actually gone back from the beginning of my time at film school uh, to sort out all of my confidential waste. I've got letters, beautiful letters of rejection from so many people. Sir Philip Green. Anybody heard of Sir Philip Green? He was a guy behind BHS. Um, I went back to him in the day to say, Philip, I'm making a new film. Would you put some money in to um, help me get it made? And he said, Ken, it's a lovely, tremendous idea, but <clears throat> bugger off. I'm not going to help you. Uh, Richard Branson, I've written to people at Paramount. Spielberg, it's a good laugh to look back on your letters and see perhaps how naive you were. But the thing is, if you don't ask, you do not get and something I was just picked up on earlier speaking to Ricardo before he came in, there's a lot of money out there for people wanting to make films. You just have to know where to find it. It is available to you. It's not impossible. It does help if you are connected, but everything you need exists right now. You do not need to reinvent the wheel. I remember in 1999, I was absolutely lucky to go to the Cannes Film Festival. So to be kind of, you know, posh and swanky and stuff and you do meet a lot of people i met the actor uh what's his name tim he's a really tall tall guy he was married to um tim robbins because he was there before he shot um that film about mars 
and there was a press junket for Spike Lee's Summer of Sam. We actually got to the press conference, not because we're invited, because we we're walking out of the corridor in the hotel, we got lost. We joined the back of their entourage and went in. But Tim Robbins was there, a uh, really nice guy. I don't think we shook hands, but I was starstruck and I just said, oh, Tim, hi. I liked your film, Arlington Road, which came out the year before. Very gracious, he said, thank you. But the whole point of talking about Ken is, if you get a meeting and people do, do you know about Ken, by the way, first of all? Yeah, Ken is like one of the biggest uh, film festivals in the world. There's also a lot of business happens there to get things made. And I took my first film there just before it's finished to try and get distribution, uh, which made me laugh actually, because you see these lovely hotels. What's the one thing you wouldn't expect to find in a, ho in a corridor of a hotel? Somebody shout out, what wouldn't you expect to find in a corridor of a hotel? Say again. I like it. Wrong film, but yeah. Any other suggestions? Actually, remarkably close in one way. I'll tell you. A big dumpsters for putting rubbish in. Do you know what kind of rubbish, surprisingly, was in these hotels during the middle of the Cannes Film Festival? Did you say scripts? Spot on. It's almost comic. All these little pleb writers like me, screenwriters, going to Cannes, trying to land a deal. They're probably having meetings and people are saying, bye, because they were about, I remember seeing two bins full of scripts. And it happens all the time. Has anybody, well, you perhaps haven't written to, have you heard of Working Title, the film company? Have you ever tried ringing them? It is a fascinating process. It's literally, hello, hold the line. Hello, hold the line. Hello, hold the line. And then I managed to get through and had a physical meeting actually in the Working Title building to see someone. And I was set waiting in the uh, reception. And literally, I saw the receptionist, hello, hold the line, hello, hold the line. The, the calls coming in, the volume, because these guys produced Notting Hill, uh, so many other great films, Four Weddings and a Funeral, incredibly popular company, and of course, it's still rolling now. Um, my whole point here is, if you're a creative at all levels, in all disciplines, get used to rejection. Yeah, what really cracks me up as a filmmaker, people will tell you, people in fact, love to tell you exactly what they think about your work. If you don't like being told something very personal, I say get a job doing something else. Yeah, I've had people come up to me and uh, say, after the screen of one film in particular, Ken, I can't say the word, but you know, it was a quite a rude word. And they're talking to you, these are friends. And other people have said, that was great, they've enjoyed your work, but people tell you how they feel about your work. So if you don't like it, get used to it. One thing I would say about that is, as artists here, if you're writers or filmmakers, whatever you do, get used to, I don't know, you have to believe in yourself and get used to satisfying yourself. What does that mean to you guys? What does it mean to anybody here? Apart from the obvious things, <laughs> how artistically would you satisfy yourself? Being happy with what you Spot on. It's true, it's nothing to do with ego. Certainly working as a director, being there plenty of times of when you say action and cut, if you're not concrete in your conviction about what you're doing, what's gonna happen to you? Someone else shout out. Uh, take a backward step before then. You're very warm, you're spot on. Any other ideas of what would happen when you say action and cut, but you're not quite sure? That's it. The crew and the actors will start to walk away. You need to be bulletproof in knowing artistically and managerially what you are doing in that moment, because you will see people, oh, well, he's not sure what performance I'm giving, and you know, I'm, oh, you know, I can't really get behind him. You need to be concrete, you know, stay secure on what you're doing, otherwise it'll start to fall apart for you badly. You don't need to make things up. It's nothing to do with ego. It's just you satisfying yourself and knowing where you want to go and what your story is about, yeah? 
So keep getting rejected. And so guess what? I've been to film school. What's the logical thing for me to do after having my scripts rejected? True, but then again, I couldn't really care about someone else's opinion to a certain degree, but that is correct, yeah? So, uh, say that again. Do it yourself. Don't keep moving on. It's a good point. I've seen people with fantastic work, and there possibly could be somebody in here who could be Oscar-worthy or whatever you want to win. Um, but I see people cannibalizing their own work. They start writing an idea, they can't see a vision for it. You must always have a vision for your created work as to where it's going to go. Uh, but they lose sight of it and they start tweaking it and changing it and messing it around and passing it around to different people. Different people give input to it. And they really start to screw it up over a period of time. I know of one person who is, is a mate and he's had a lot of money for a feature film. And he's gone through about five different versions of the same film in that time with about, well, like just under a half a million pounds in budget. He's tried to tell six different films when he started off with one idea. So stick to what you're going to do. Have a vision for your work. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Wonderful. So back then, this would have been circa 1998, I think. Da, 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 da. I had a Hi8 camera, which was, okay, a much better format than Super 8. My girlfriend said she lent me 200 quid to melt my movie, and I obtained a copy of Adobe Premiere by means we don't need to go into. <laughs> yeah. The point being, and I do not advocate the use of stolen software, I just say do it by any means necessary. Get what tools you need to do what you need to do. And if someone goes, well... Have your vision. Get your product out. You've got to make it happen. Yeah? Because uh, you only learn by crash and burning and doing stuff. This is essentially how I got my first film together, which is Kingdom. Kingdom is a family film. We made it. Um, anybody heard of Blair Witch? The Blair Witch Project, yeah? I probably, this is how I got backing for my films. I did a presentation uh, in 19, I don't know, 98 at a group of uh, business angels, people, a bit like Dragon's Den, who've got lots of money to put into a project. And I went along saying, hello, my name is Kenneth Barker. I want to make a film about dragons. And the room went completely silent because people were there talking about bioengineering, computing, technology. For me to say, I want to make this film about dragons, it's just uh, penny drop time. Point being, though, afterwards, um, people were milling and round and drinking and eating and greeting and networking, yeah? Uh, I got introduced to this chap, and um, this guy said, oh, this guy, Kenneth here, who wants to make a film, would you put some money in? And this other guy, he just laughed in my face. But guess what happened 10 days later? Shout, come on, what do you think happened 10 days later? Say again? Came back to me. He came back to me. Yeah, I remember the call very clear. It was a Wednesday evening. I was cooking pasta. I do a mean pasta. I got a phone call, and the guy said, are you still looking for a backer? Because I'm interested. Well, wow. He put in enough money for us to get a much better quality camera and to cover some transport and food and other bits and pieces. We still had to struggle, but we got the film made. So uh, we're not industrial light and magic here, not wetter. What made him change his mind? Do you know what he said? Um, you've all have heard of business plans, yeah? You have an idea, you want to get the thing commercialized, so you have to work out in detail how you're going to raise the money and how you're going to return the money. He said he liked my personality and the way I came across at the meeting because at that point, I had my little camera, I had 200 quid, a couple of Mars bars and some dodgy software. I didn't give a sod. I was going to make my bloody film anyway, yeah? Um... That came across in the meeting, and the guy said he liked my personality, and he also did a bit of due diligence on me. Due diligence just means he did a bit of digging, yeah, because you have to be completely open as a filmmaker, especially if you're wanting to get people's money off them, their investment. They need to know, can I trust you? Can I trust you? Are you reliable? Will you do what you say you will do? Yeah? Um, so that's what changed his mind. He just he had a vibe enjoyed it and this guy is a very social guy 
He had no interest in film per se. He, his trade was a farmer and his son's a pig farmer, but he put the money in. So that was tremendous. It basically launched my career. So it's Kingdom. Um, here's one of the characters from Kingdom. There you go. You have to bear in mind, guys, this was made with no money back in 1998. This is Manuk van der Mulen, who's done a lot of TV and other bits and pieces. And this is our Warrior Dragon, which was done in Lightwave. Any geeks here? No? Oh, Lightwave is a very old piece of um, software for creating bits and pieces. Have you heard of, um, what's that BBC program? Dinosaurs on, what's it called? <sighs> Walking with Dinosaurs. <laughs> Walking with Dinosaurs, it was made by Frame Store. I think they did the scanning. We went to them. I had to design the dragons. There's five dragons featured in the film. I made the dragon out of, of um, air hardening clay. And the bone structure is my chicken dinner. Just ate the chicken, then heated up all the bones in a pan to get rid of all the excess meat. And then you stick them into your, your dragon. Literally, we made half of a dragon. And then we had it scanned at frame store. And then we took all the data files back up to Leeds join the two halves together, put wings on, did the animation, put a digital bone structure inside, and then you have a fully articulated dragon. Great fun. We launched the film not knowing how to actually do any of this stuff. Um, and my animator, Arif, came to me one day and he gave me a test of the first dragon lip syncing to some dialogue. At that moment, I knew I had my film. So that was a real big step. Otherwise, You'd have lots of dragons go, hello, we can't see our lips. But he gave me, hello, we can move our lips, we can talk, we can interact. Today, today, technically, the film, it could be, I don't know, seen as ad adolescent. It's good family fun, and it worked, and it got completed. That's the key thing about it. And it's on sale, so please buy a copy for every member of your family. <laughs> there you go. That's, I will never plug your own way. <laughs> uh, this is um, me. And my boy, Yoa Factor, at the premiere in Leeds back in, well, 19th of November, 1999. Well, hey, black tie event. It was great fun. Yoav, um, he's a director. He's actually living in New York now. He made a film called, anybody on a smartphone here? I'm sure I've seen people flicking away. He made a film called Reuniting the Rubin, starring uh, Timothy Spall, Rona Mitra, on a Blackman and James Callas, so names. He got just under a million quid to make his film. It does happen, yeah? Just under a million pounds. I think he made use of the tax break, soft money to get the film produced. So that's Yoav. Who's prettier, him or me? Don't answer, anyone. Right, my second film, anybody heard of Maria Callas? I hear one, I hear a voice nodding. Maria Callas, she's a very famous opera singer. So for my second film, I kind of stole her story a bit. And um, my film was called Rosetta Prima Donna Assoluta. It's about an opera singer who could have become really famous, could have predated Maria Callas, but she became ill. She had a cancerous polyp in her throat. So the doctors told her, you can have an operation to get rid of this, but you'll never sing again. So what we do, we pick up the story when she's also incidentally pregnant as well. Uh, she has the operation, then she disappears from society, becomes a recluse, and guess where she shows up? In Leeds, living in a block of flats somewhere. She happens to live next door to a guy who owns a record shop in the Grand Arcade. Anybody remember Polar Bear Records? Polar Bear Records back in the day. We shot in there for about four days. It was great fun. The point of the story is, though, uh, in Polar Bear Records, one of the characters finds one of her original recordings. And he's, you know, when you find something which is amazing, yeah, and it's worth a lot of money perhaps to you or to other people, he finds one of her records, he pays 50 quid for it. Later on in the film, he sells it for about 12 grand. Uh, so her career becomes re-ignited. Uh, I didn't actually realize until years later, there's a lady called Julie Andrews. Anybody seen Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? Is, it she, is she in that? No, she's not. Mary Poppins. Yeah. Actually, I didn't realize I paralleled her life story with mine because she was very ill. She could have lost her career, but she prevailed. Julie Andrews, Rosetta DiCurci. Her films cost a lot of money. Money, Mine cost less money. 
Now, there you go. That was Rosetta. My third film, anybody remember Jimmy Savile? <laughs> Jimmy Savile, eh? I uh, used to live in Round Hay, around the corner from Jimmy Savile. So I would see him frequently. Um, he was a very gracious guy, so it shows you. He was a very gracious guy. We'd, I'd be out in the park and walk by or with my girlfriend. Hi, Jimmy. He'd say hello. We'd go to the Lakeside Cafe in the park. He'd be courted by members of the public coming up to him and saying hi. He'd always spend time with people and talk to them. Fabulous. I bumped into him one day in the city center of Leeds. Mm. And um, I said, Jimmy, I'm making this new film. I've got a little cameo for you. Would you be interested in it? That was my next film. I'll just quickly fill you in. It's called Catalina, a new kind of superhero. It's about a transvestite superhero, of all things. And I pitched this to Jimmy, and um, so I thought he'd be great to just get in there, and perhaps he's got a lot of brand recognition. Uh, so I pitched this to Jimmy Savile, and he looked at me, and he said, Ken, that sounds like a really interesting idea, but... I won't do it because I'm a bit concerned about my family image. <laughs> of course, exactly. <laughs> Years later, yeah, it is absolutely true. We were talked in WH Smith in the train station. He listened to me. I did him. I gave him the elevator pitch. Um, I think I dodged a bullet <laughs> because it could have sunk my film. Yeah. Uh, a couple of technical things about this. We, there is Grimsby College. Part of their remit is they are sponsored by Sony and BT. They had an absolute ton of very high-end cinema-grade um, cameras and digital equipment. And their remit is, is to give it to Northern-based filmmakers for guess how much money? Guess how much? Shout out. How much did you think it cost us to borrow their kit? Grand a day? I have, do I have any advances on a grand a day? Grand a day? A thousand. A thousand? Keep going. Do we have any more advances? This is very expensive gear we're talking about. 10K. I'll put you out of your misery. Zero. Yet. Nothing. It was their remit to support northern-based filmmakers. We had gear I couldn't even dream about. The body for this camera was about 35 grand. The lens was 65 grand. They just gave it to me. I could have sold it on eBay, but... Uh, one day we were shooting in Temple Newsome Park. We had this beautiful 100, pound, 100 grand piece of kit, camera, mounted on a carbon fiber uh, crane boom. And I don't know, it must have been a bit of an oversight because the um, camera is up and we were chatting about doing the next shot. And you know what happened? The wind caught the camera and it started to topple over. I don't usually scream in public, but then I did. Luckily, we caught the bloody camera. And we finished the film. But the film was shot at a very high quality. It's got about 347 visual effects in. Of course, it's a film about a transvestite superhero. It's played slightly tongue-in-cheek, but is very respectful. And when I did the research into the screenplay, guess what I found? A very interesting statistic. I'll, give, I'll work backwards. The answer is si around about 60%. You could say, Ken, that's BS, but that's the research I read. What could 60% do to be relative or relevant to do this film? Anybody, shout out. Or let thee know. Or let thee know. Apparently, it's the number of men who like to cross-dress and wear women's clothing. 60% in the population. So... I say nothing. The film got it got slated. Do you know, I think it got slated in one way because a lot of guys said, um, oh, it's all rubbish. I don't do that. And then they go home and they cross dress, perhaps. Yeah, I don't know. Too, cl <laughs> too close to home. But we had great fun making the film. So that's Catalina. Anybody heard of Forbidden Planet? Yeah, an absolute genre titan. Um, by chance, I, um, when I lived in Roundhay, my neighbor's partner runs a very successful 
a telecommunications company called AQL. They run data center number three in the Salem building by Tetley Brewery. And I was talking to him, blah, 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 blah. and he said, Ken, well, look, we've got this great big empty hall. Why don't you come in there for 10 months and shoot your film in this particular building? For I? Because to get a location like that for nothing for that block of time, what, what would you do? What would you do? Shout. Say yes. Absolutely. Yes, and give them a big kiss. Damn, absolutely. Gave me the chance to do this. It's like it was my version of Forbidden Planet. But totally, obviously, original story, but it's retro sci-fi. I love science fiction. I love fantasy. I love Woody Allen. I like straight drama. I like the whole range of film. But we had a chance to make this retro sci-fi film in this guy's church hall. We built a bridge for a starship. We built a massive green screen. It was literally the length of this wall, which allowed us to travel around the universe or from a building in Hunslet. <coughs> On the shoulders of giants. Basically, the subtext story behind this is if you create a technology, you cannot uninvent a technology. So a good example would be nuclear power. Anybody heard of nuclear power? Yeah, what can it be used for? Nuclear power. Nuclear bombs or like radio, like TV, spot on. Absolutely spot on. You could use it to create, destroy things or for the good of everyone else. In the context of my film, a spaceship is created with a wormhole drive so it can travel really far. It disappears with a genius on board and these guys have to go and do a rescue mission of it. What they don't realize is it's landed on this computer planet, which has actually been used as a weapon for blowing things up. And this guy has become a bit maniacal and they need to stop him. It was great fun doing it. And um, guess what? I'm a bit of a romance maker because when we were shooting, the lead actor on top, Sarah, and this rather handsome looking chap here, Carl, I said to Carl when we were shooting, bear in mind we've got no budget, look, any crew or actors who need to stay at my place, you know, I will put you up for the duration, yeah? So Carl said, yeah, yeah, because I'm coming from, you know, Minsk or wherever millions of miles away he was coming from. Uh, I would stay with you, Ken, but you never actually stayed over at any time. There's only afterwards that I found out at the rap party, they're all kissy-kissy because -kissy, those two had got together. And guess what happened shortly after? They got married and they have a beautiful baby child, all on my film. So there we go, success <laughs> on a plate. Very proud of this film because, okay, we shot it on relatively low tech equipment, but we had a very big crew and cast, a lot of sponsors. It's got about 700 visual effects in, um, but we blended so many things together. We had live action, digital sets, digital set extensions, pure CG sets. We used digital characters, prosthetics, a whole nine yards. So if somebody says to you, well, you can't actually do your idea because it's too ambitious, what would you say to them? Keep it polite. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. Um, for a long time, everything I've done, people have said, oh, you can't do that. Or whatever. No, you can. I'm here to tell you, I'm the poster boy. Actually, yes, you can. Yeah? If you put your mind to it, you can do it. So that is on the shores of giants. Question for you. If you're going to fight a dinosaur, what is the most inappropriate thing you would wear? You're very warm, incredibly warm. <laughs> Possibly. What was that? Sorry. I'm not sure what one of those is. Keep going. Come on. What would you wear which is most inappropriate to fight dinosaurs? <laughs> I, don't, I don't follow football. I don't know if they're even placed. Perhaps this. <laughs> Bikini girls versus dinosaurs. This, I want to just have pure fun. It is... Um, it's not salacious. A 10-year-old could watch this. It is just a sci-fi schlock cheese fest. The film was designed to be watched and consumed with pizza or whatever your favorite food with is and your mates. 
the three space princesses, they go around fighting the galaxy and defending against the bad guys called the Block Horde. When they're not eating sausage rolls at parties, they all kind of hang out together. And their stepmother, Volatina, wants to, to take their crown away. So she sabotages their mission one day, and they end up going through a time walk. Guess where? 70 million years into Earth's past. So um, this is where they start fighting various dinosaurs. You can see it's quite cheesy, yeah? And it's played very much tongue-in-cheek. And there's conjecture in the film that A, were dinosaurs killed by cheese? And B, did the Bikini Girls pressing the wrong buttons on their time machine to come back home inadvertently cause dinosaur extinction? You'll have to watch a copy to find out. But we used, um, we shot this on HD, we shot it pretty much in Temple Newsome, Round Hay Park, a glorious summer in 2013. Just had a hoot, and it's a great film. It's actually one of the pieces which has been given the most reaction from my work so far. I wonder why. Okay. Dinosaurs. Di there we go, <laughs> dinosaurs, absolutely. The serious depiction of dino dinosaurs' uh, lifestyles, yep. Right, so what I'm working on now is two things. I'm going back to my retro roots. I have a two-year-old boy, and he was building this little toy car of Lego or whatever, and I built this little um, creature or Martian thing. And I thought, hang about, I've never seen a triple mashup of Earth versus Martians versus giant robots. So, you know, of course, I'm going to have to make it. So this is just some concept art of mucked up to produce. This, because the way technology has changed, I know this can be sold as a stream and it can reach globally around the world. I'll show how much money it will make. You've all heard of Amazon, haven't you? Has anybody actually streamed anything from Amazon or have you, anybody here produced anything to go on Amazon stream? Uh, well, back in the day, which is literally about a year ago, you could make a lot of money on Amazon. I made some good money selling my work on Amazon. But now Amazon are getting rid of all the independent filmmakers. Literally, on the Tuesday I went to bed, on, on the Wednesday they booted two of my films off their server. But not just me, tens of thousands of independent filmmakers around the world. Um, and you know how much money Amazon are paying out now per hour of your feature film? Take a guess. Streams, take a guess. Per hour of your feature film around the world, okay? I have someone shouting out 40 grand. Who said 7p? 7p, thank you very much. Do we have any advances on 7p? 1p? <laughs> any advances on one pence? It's actually approximately 0 0.009 of a penny. Yep. For one hour of the film you've busted your ass to make, Amazon are now paying 1p. Yeah, and all the big uh, streaming services because of. I don't know. If you can get into Netflix, I will marry you and run away and have your babies because Netflix <laughs> is true. Netflix is closed shop. If you can get into Netflix, you've landed. It is a huge, huge market, yeah, which they curate very well. You can't, they will not accept uh, filmmakers' offerings. You have to have a relationship with them. But if you get onto Netflix, you'll make a lot of money. Yep. Um, so this film will go to streaming. And the other film I'm working on is called Air. It's about an international air race set just after World War II. Have you heard of those magnificent men and their flying machines? Yep. And The Great Race, Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis. I know some of you guys are nodding, some aren't. These are great films to perhaps discover one day, yeah? Um, my film, it's, it's not a cheese fest, it's played straight, but we're going to have comedic moments in, yeah? Technically, it could produce right here in Leeds because a lot of it is just going to be built in green screen or virtual production, so it's stepping up the technology game. There's also, if anybody's on a smartphone right now, look up Neom, N-E-O-M. You might be shooting part of the film in Neon. You possibly won't find much because it's a new province in northern Saudi Arabia, which are opening up to filmmakers and as a tourist destination. I have a friend who I went to film school with who works for Al Jazeera now, 
They're shooting a new film over there with Gerard Butler, um, but they want to encourage more filmmakers to come in. And the encouragement is you get a, up to a 40% rebate of your money. So if you have an investor who's going to put in 10 million quid for your live action shoot, they could get up to 40% of that money back. It suddenly makes you look a lot more attractive. So that's a very quick part of history of my work. Wanted to just leave you guys with a couple of things. Not a blank screen. It's very too far away to read. Coming here is like a fantasy land. Why is it like a fantasy land? Bear in mind what I was doing on film before. Sharp? The tech. The tech. You can do more today in anything you're doing than you could years ago. Harness the technology. If you're a creative, you know, writers as well, across the board, use the technology. It will allow you to do so much more per pound of effort expended. Yeah? Harness the technology. If you think you want to be really super specialized, you might come a cropper because more people are now grabbing hold of more things to actually help themselves get ahead. It's a big, massive marketplace out there. There you go. It says, your mum might care about your film and your dad might care about your film, but no one else gives to, you know, about your film. You must, you must care about your film because you're the one who's going to have to finish it and you're the one who's going to have to market it. And, you know, the hard part of making a film is actually, you know, finishing it and then marketing it. There's no point in making a film, and this happens right now all the time. It's people making work, but they don't know where they can sell it, or they've got nothing left to sell it. So you've got to care about your work. It means if you have an idea, and somebody said earlier on, make it better, yeah, just stick to your guns. <laughs> Anybody here use social media? Silly question. Use your social media, bloggers, visuals, the whole nine yards. Anybody heard of a shop called Bolangara Trevor? Yeah? Very interesting group of people. There's a, a gentleman's couture shop in the city center in Thornton's Arcade. And what they do, well, their USP for their business is they only make 100 garments of any item of clothing. So they'll get friends and hangers on to model their clothing in catwalk parades in uh, Thornton Arcade, but they invite bloggers and videographers and photographers to come along and to capture everything. And then they put this on the internet and they get a massive amount of exposure. This is exactly what I'll be doing for my next project and what I put to you guys. In fact, don't even waste time making your film, just publicize it, sell the merchandise. Did I mention streaming earlier on? Stream. What does granular mean in the context of marketing, anyone? Granular. No. You're very warm, incredibly warm. You're very warm. Any advances on streaming? Uh, sorry, on granular. I'm thinking particularly about film or, in fact, anything anybody in this room could create, which is a digital file format. Well, I I'll put 10 quid down. Pretty much everyone here is connected to the internet or knows someone who's connected to the internet in some way. That means you've got, your marketplace is global. I love peanut butter. I guarantee you there's somebody in this room who doesn't like peanut butter, yeah? All our choices, so I hang game, all our choices are massively different. If you can reach all those different people, you get granular down to the individual, you can sell your product, you can show people your film. 20 years ago, you could not do this. Today, you can show a whole film which costs a quid to make. Anybody heard of Colin, a film about vamp, uh, zombies? Colin. It was made for £45, and I, I can't remember what year it was, but it took the Cannes Film Festival by storm. It made a lot of money, and it cost £45 to make. I think that might have been an exaggeration, but it was marketed on being 45 quid. The film, what I've seen of it, is pretty awful, but who cares? It's made a lot of money. 45 quid, caught a mass week through streaming. Finally, this is a thing. If you've paid, I know some of you haven't paid no attention to anything I've said today, you need to do this. 
have a vision for your work. Satisfy yourself. And that means know what story or what article or what thing you are doing. Because if you don't have that vision, you'll just end up burning out. Yeah, and sometimes you can't land your film in a quick go. It can take a couple of years to finish the film. Always have a vision for your work. Brilliant, guys. That's it. I just wish you good luck because you need luck, you need opportunity, and you need self-belief. Yeah? Thanks for your time, folks. Ken, thank you. <clears throat> I just want to say, really appreciate you coming, and um, you you have an independent spirit, you know, as a as a filmmaker, um, at, as a producer, as a filmmaker, and I know how difficult it is to make to make a film. I made a, you know I've made a number of short films. To make a feature film is a massive undertaking, and I think that because there are so many feature films that are out there that we can choose from, that it kind of, it almost um, takes away from the amount of work, artistry, time, commitment, love, pain that goes into, into making something. And this is very film heavy, and I know we've got some journalists and, and um, here, but even within your field and within your area, there's so much stuff, so much content that we can easily forget about the people and the individuals that are behind making it. So I've got every respect for individuals that not only come up with an idea, but then can follow it all the way through to completion, which I, I think some a lot of you will, will, will have already experienced how hard it is to finish something, you know, that, that you, you're totally passionate about. So credit for you for, for finishing your films and still having the energy to do that. And also for the idea, which I think is particularly exciting, is this thing about the, the granular notion of it, that we have all been conditioned into thinking about broadcast media and where we're going onto a big screen or our films being showcased in big cinemas. But this is a planet and with every passing day, every passing month, it becomes more and more connected. So in theory, as a, an individual, as an entrepreneur, all you need is 5,000 people on planet earth, 10,000 who really connect and believe in what you say and your ideas. And if they're regularly prepared to commit, which isn't, and when you think about 7 billion people, we're just talking about five, ten thousand 10,000 people. And if they're prepared to, to, to regularly invest annually for you, then that's a living. You know? And it can be something like Bikini Girls def defeating dinosaurs. It might not rock your world, but it might rock somebody else's. And there's a benefit in that. So I'll rate you. And thank you very much for coming in. And if we've got any time, have we, do we have any, any questions at all? Yeah, right. Thank you very much. Um, what advice would you give your 20 year old self? <laughs> um, give me a bit more context about um, what exactly? In terms of like career and like career building and career planning. If um, somebody's saying, come with us and we'll show you how to do X, Y, and Z, listen and take up an opportunity. A lot of people will go, oh, don't do that because it's not paid or, you know, you need to um, do go over here and get paid. There's this huge argument which always goes around about getting jobs which are always paid. Sometimes you need to just take the experience because when you do that, you get to network and people remember your name and your face and they'll go, this person was really cool. You know, we didn't have any money then but we're going to get her on this next production. And I've seen that happen all the time. It's even happening right now for the company I'm working for. So keep your vision and just keep an eye for opportunity. And sometimes don't listen to other people. Literally follow your brain and your heart. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, hey, how would you recommend uh, just working on sets and going around to work yourself on a set? If that makes sense. Sorry, say that again. How, so would, how, you would, you go, how would you recommend, like, finding out how to work and where to work on a set? 
Good question. Are you on any other uh, key internet forums like um, Mandy and that kind of thing? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Go up pen handy. Get your pen handy. Uh, <laughs> Mandy.com. You know, there's a ton of good forums on uh, Facebook. Uh, there's connected campus as well. Yeah. Yeah. Shooting people. I know it's more London centric. Uh, there are so many great forums. There is a lot of northern-based uh, filmmaker forums as well with live jobs on, paying jobs. Um, one a guy called John Coulter told me many years ago, be known for knowing things. doesn't mean you have to speak all the time. It just mean, means being on the ground and, and connecting. So good question. Once again, if you build up experience, sometimes you've got to suck it up to do jobs where you're not getting paid, but people will remember you if you don't screw up. A bit like being an actor turn up don't bump into the furniture yeah thank you for your question um i saw a uh, a quote from the director of uh june he said that the main audience member i made this film for was me do you think that when you make your films you're making the films for yourself as well as the audience brilliant question yeah there's a, a strong duality there once again you have to learn to satisfy yourself um, but also being a commercial filmmaker, does your commercial um, sensibility allow you to tune into what other people like? So I'd say, yeah, if it tickles you, especially when you're starting out, it's if anybody says to you making films is easy, they're taking you down a blind path. It's going to be hard. You have to absolutely be in love with your film. Spielberg, as opposed to that ch chap, uh, he's quoted as saying a great thing about working one of his earlier films. I won't say what it is. It's quite rude. But the point being, you have to love your film. And George Lucas, a lot of people criticize him. But there's a great piece in his documentary about how Phantom Menace was made when he's being interviewed. And he's saying to the interviewer, this is my stuff. Some people won't like it. But I have to be incredibly passionate about my film because I've got to carry it for the next two years, two or three years. So, yeah. Love what you're doing first, and your enthusiasm will bounce off to other people. And hopefully, it's like granular thing again. Ten thousand people, a hundred thousand people might hate your work, but you know, millions more could love it. If you look at my work on Amazon or whatever else, some of my reviews are just crazy. People appear to want to go out and shoot me down. Yeah, so what? I've stopped reading reviews because there's other people who dig the work and who can understand it. You know, everybody's got different choices. So that's what I was saying earlier on about being thick skinned. If you believe in what you're doing, that stuff will just bounce off you. And a lot of people will criticize, well, where's your work? You know, you've got out there and you've made your product. So that's a spot on question. Thank you. I've got someone uh, just doing that. Oh. Yeah, this is kind of related to the last question, actually. Um, so Ridley Scott's just directed uh, The Last Jewel. Um, it says Magnum Opus got brilliant reviews, absolutely bombed in the box office. Um, and now there's a studio that's probably saying to him, well, can you do like, I don't know, an MCU film or something that will guarantee us money in the future? Um, but I'm guessing based on what you said, he'll still have felt to him that movie is quite successful. And is it a good thing as an independent filmmaker that you get to make your own choices without having to? Brilliant question, because the way uh, film finance works is incredibly complex. And over the course of time, the cost of that production will find a way of being recouped. Um, and because you're an independent filmmaker, you get the chance to make the films which please you. Back to that question over there. I think unless someone's saying, here's 200 grand, make the film that I want to see, make your own choices. And Ridley's going to be playing at a level where his, what what's his fee on a kind of feature film, do you think? It's a film that's like $100 million, $100 million budget, which for an epic historical mm. now yeah. is like very unusual to yeah. get that much money because he's got such a huge brand name and immediate recognition. I'm trying to get air financed. So I've got the tax break. It's related to your question. It's a film I'm very turned on by. If you're not turned on by your work, I'd say just stay at home or do a different job because you need to really drive it. I've got the tax break and I'm speaking to a financier who are reasonably well-known. We have a dialogue going on 
these guys are credible because they've put money into uh, a Tom Cruise film and several other films. Um, they said, Ken, yeah, okay, we're really interested, but have you got your actor? So I've gone to a very well-known actor right now. I've spoken to their agent and I've pitched them. They haven't said sod off. They've listened to my pitch, but they say, Ken, have you got the finance? Are you green lit? I can't get the two to marry up. Without the actor, I can't get the money. Without the money, I can't get the actor. So my choice of film just can't land it. So um, you've got your own personal choice. I'm not in a position to be bankrolled like Ridley Scott is so far. But that will come, I think, in time. I don't think in one way Ridley, Ridley Scott's had several bombs in his career. He'll be back in more force. And you've seen his body of work. is amazing, isn't it? So I'd like to be like Ridley. Be like Ridley. Good question. Thank you very much. Okay. Any more questions? Who's going to be successful here? Me, all of us. Okay, that. That's good. <laughs> good. Either go hard or go home, guys. This is what I'm. What I'm about. I had to tell the boss. I asked them, "Can I take the afternoon off work because I'm here to steal from you guys to be reinvigorated and re-inspired?" And that's not a bad thing. Always copy from the best. And when your friends are going, well, no, don't do that or do X, Y, and stick to what you know. Yeah. So if you want to be successful, I expect somebody in here one day to be winning an Oscar or a Pulitzer or whatever your or Mercury Prize, whatever a writing award is, just do it. It'll take some hard work, but do it. Yeah. Can I just add to that, that I think a lot of us spend a lot of time thinking and talking about our ideas and then sometimes kind of maybe thinking those ideas away where you kind of go, do you know what? Maybe not. Or I haven't got this or I haven't got that. And I say that it doesn't, doesn't have to be brilliant. It has to be finished. Yeah. And it has to be out there and seen. So if you're not blogging and if you're not making your shorts, then you're okay. You, there's nothing wrong with you, but you, you're just on a slower track. So just get it made. Yeah. Get it finished and don't get in the way of being a perfectionist too early. Just, just get, just get it done and get it out there. And then it's like, I think it's like magic. It starts attracting. If you keep your eyes open, you might be looking down there for something, but it's actually, it comes from over here, you know, but because you've got it made, keep your eyes open and you'll see it starts attracting an energy. But it ain't going to happen until you've made it happen. Yeah. Ken, you're a superstar. Thank you very much. Are we good?